Now, if you have uh, arachnophobia, then um, you and I have something in common, right? Arachnophobia is the fear of spiders, right? Uh, phobia is a Greek word, and it is a word that occurs in the New Testament, which was originally written in Greek. And so this morning, I'd like us to think about fear, uh, three fears to be exact. Now, the word phobia and arachnophobia and other words like that, uh, it would mean to uh, be afraid, uh, to feel a sense of terror or panic. Now, this is probably when we hear the word fear and phobia, this is probably the first thing we think of. Um, but this is not the only meaning of the word and how it's used in the Bible. The Scriptures use the word fear to indicate a few different ideas. So this morning I'd like us to think about this word and how it relates to our faith in God. So again, i got three different kinds of fear I'd like to share with you uh, this morning. Three types of fear that we read about in Scripture. And the first one is fearful awe. Um, if you have your Bible, please open it with me to Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 28. If you would like to uh, follow along, I'm going to start in Matthew chapter 28 this morning. Think about these two words. If uh, I say to you, I'm having an awesome day, right? We all know that means, you know, good things are happening. It's a great day. Um, but if I say to you, I'm having an awful day, well, that means the very opposite, doesn't it? In today's English, they communicate, these words communicate different ideas, even though they're, they're both based on the word awe, right? You see that, and you know, that's the root word there, awe. And awe is defined as fear mingled with admiration or reverence, reverential fear. And I think this is a, a good example of what we'll be looking at this morning because the word fear as it occurs in the Bible, it has this kind of flexibility. Uh, it can be used in a, in a bad sense, a negative connotation, that something is awful, it's uh, causes you to, to be afraid. It's terrible. It's horrible. But it also has a positive connotation that, again, it's, it's awesome. Uh, it gives you a sense of awe or wonder. And it uses, the Bible uses this word fear in both of these senses. So look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 8. Here's speaking about the women who uh, went to Jesus' tomb early that Sunday morning. Matthew 28, 28, sorry, 28, verse 8, and I'm reading from the King James. It says, They departed quickly from the sepulcher, and notice it says, with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. So here we read about these, these ladies who had fear and great joy. So again, think about that word fear. And again, it's, it's from where we get our word phobia, if you want to be you know, interested in Greek and looking up the word. Now, to me, it's, it's doubtful that the word fear here would indicate a crippling terror. Right? They were just filled with terror. They were afraid and had joy. Right? That, to me, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And uh, however you look at this word, it's a reminder that we must be discerning. Uh, you must be willing, as you read the Bible, to think about words, how words fit into a context. And you know, a single word can have several different definitions. And so you think about what definition of a word is being used. There are versions of, of the Bible which do indeed indicate that this word means terror. In Matthew 28, verse 8. Um, here's one translation called the Bible for everyone. And it says, The women scurried off quickly away from the tomb in a mixture of terror and great delight and went to tell his disciples. Now, in my opinion, for whatever it's worth to you, uh, I don't think that's a good translation. I think these two emotions are incompatible. You know, that's a strange combination, don't you think? Here are these women who are going to the tomb, 
and they're terrified and simultaneously greatly delighted? Again, just in my opinion, I don't think those two things can really be happening at the same time, those two emotions. Um, Here's a different um, translation. Same verse. Filled with awe and great joy, the women came quickly away from the tomb and ran to tell the disciples. To me, that makes much more sense. Now, most translations like the King James, they, they won't... Um, when they translate it, they won't try to further interpret the word. They'll just put fear because that's just the, that's the Greek word and that's it, fear. But I think it would be, in my opinion, more helpful to have a little bit more interpretation here. And I think the word awe is the correct kind of fear that Matthew is, is describing. Uh, when these women went to the tomb and they saw the tombs empty and the angel spoke with them and the angel does say, be not afraid. And there probably does mean, you know, don't be afraid, don't be scared. But then they, they leave. Again, are they leaving just terrified out of their minds? No, I think they're leaving with a sense of, of awe and delight, you know, that Christ is risen. Um, here's also Psalm 66, verse 5. This, again, this is a King James Version. Come and see the works of God. He is terrible in His doing toward the children of men. Right, there's the beauty of the King James Version. Uh, the King James, as I think many of you know, is my favorite translation. And this verse is an example of what is probably its greatest weakness. Uh, the King James has existed so long. It was originally published in the year 1611. So, I mean, it's been around longer than our country's been around. Right? It was, it's been around so long that some common definitions of words have changed. And if a person's not familiar with the Jacobean English that's used in the King James, and um, again, just not familiar with kind of uh, King James definitions of words, if I could use, use that phrase, what are they going to think about this verse? What are they going to think this verse says? Right? Someone might think this verse teaches God does bad things, terrible things to people. Right? Well, let's compare a few different translations. Here's the New King James. Again, these are all the same verse here. Come and see the works of God. He is awesome in His doing toward the sons of men. And uh, the NIV. Come and see what God has done. His awesome deeds for mankind. And I think this is worth saying because I know many of you like to use the King James as I do. You know, in, in the King James, especially in the Old Testament, God is called terrible quite a few times, right? He's a terrible God and, and so on. Uh, his deeds are terrible. This does not mean God is awful. Right? It means in the language of the King James, He is awesome. The Bible teaches we ought to fear God and His works, meaning we think about Him with a sense of awe, right? a sense of admiration. Uh, the second kind of fear I'd like us to think about this morning is fearful respect. Right? We, could sum, we could sum that up in one word, the word reverence. Right? Fearful respect. Um, again, if you'd like to follow along in your Bible, turn with me to Luke chapter 18. I'd like us to, to read a short passage in Luke chapter 18, if you'd like to read that with me. In Luke 18, Jesus told a parable, and in that parable, He mentions there's a man who did not fear God. By way of contrast, in Acts chapter 10, verse 2, the Scriptures speak about a man named Cornelius, and there it tells us he was a, de a devout man, one who feared God. All right, so what do these statements mean? Here the Bible describes a man who did not fear God, one man who did. All right, does this mean they were, you know, one man uh, was just completely terrified and biting his fingernails because he's so scared of God, and then another man wasn't? All right, well, let's look at Luke 18 together. Luke chapter 18, and we'll start with verse 1 here. Luke 18, verse 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. 
saying, There was in a city a judge which, and here's the phrase, feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, and here we have it repeated in verse 4, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. So we read here, this man did not fear God. Again, what does this mean? Well, if you look at verse 2, the word fear correlates to the word regard. Right? It says he did not fear God, nor did he regard man. These two words correlate in this context. So this man has two attitudes that were the same. He did not regard people, and the word fear carries the same meaning or close to the same meaning in this context. He did not fear God, meaning he did not regard God. He had no respect for God. And so Jesus is describing a person who does not obey God's will, right? The reason he's helping this woman, and it's kind of funny if you ask me, but I don't know if it's meant to be funny, right? It's not because he wants to follow God's will and he wants to you know, love God and love his neighbor as himself. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of funny, you know, he's helping this widow just because she's going to come and just constantly pester and annoy him, right? Because again, he doesn't care about God, he doesn't care about people. Right? So again, we, use, we see the word fear used that way. Now contrary to this, think about Cornelius. I mentioned him just a moment ago. And uh, Acts 10 verse 2 says he feared God. What, does, what did this fear cause him to do or result in him doing? Acts 10 verse 2, the Scriptures say, "...a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people, and pray to God alway." So we see he is a charitable man, right? Helping people with his finances. He gave alms. He's a man of prayer. He's a man who worshiped God. Well, why? Why was he charitable? Why was he a man who worshiped God? Because he feared God. Again, not he's afraid, he's terrified of God, but again, he had regard for God. He had respect for God. So when the term fear is used this way in the Bible, it is a synonym for faith. A person who fears God the same way Cornelius did is one who believes and obeys the Word of God. So, you know, stands to reason. You know, fear here again meaning reverence or respect. Again, that would be, I think, a further kind of interpretation of the word than just a direct translation of it. Uh, if a person genuine, genuinely respects the Lord, then wouldn't it make sense that person uh, will have a desire to follow the Lord, follow His will? Again, just like Cornelius did. And then the third kind of fear I'd like us to think about this morning is the fear of punishment. And in contexts such as this, uh, the word can mean you know, terror or being afraid. Um, but the New Testament does specifically talk about a, a fear of punishment. The New Testament describes the feeling of dread because of the expectation of judgment or punishment. And this kind of fear can be uh, described to, uh, or used to describe uh, human authorities, uh, those who in the government, like a, like a judge or in today's culture, a judge or police officer, someone who has uh, legal authority to punish you in some way. However, the Bible also uses this word to speak about God's judgment on those who are guilty of sin. Um, if anyone's taking notes this morning, you can jot down Romans 13, verse 3. Uh, in Romans 13, verse 3, again, this is regarding human authorities. It teaches those who govern can be a terror. That's how the King James translates it. Against the word fear, phobia. Uh, it teaches that those who govern can be a terror to those who break the law. Um, but as a general rule, they're not going to bother law-abiding citizens. Right? So Romans 13 talks about this kind of fear, this kind of terror. Um, but as I said, it's also used to describe those who uh, should fear the judgment of God. And here's one example of that in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 10 through 11. It says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 
that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And notice verse 11, it says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. So here we find an encouragement and a warning. Notice the judgment's going to be universal. Every single person, whether they're a believer or not, whether they're a sinner or a saint, every single person is going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and be judged according to what that person has done. And notice it says, whether good or bad. Right. So there's the encouragement and, and the, the warning. The Lord will once and for all condemn those who are guilty of sin, who die guilty of sin and don't have their sins washed away by the blood of Christ. And that's the warning. He will also justly reward those who are saved, right? Those who have done good, truly what is good according to God's standards of good in this life. So there's the encouragement. Now my focus is on verse 11, right? Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, Paul says we persuade men. That's, you know, that's how the King James Version reads. Other versions will say fear, knowing the fear of the Lord. We persuade people. So again, what is this? What is the, the terror or the fear of the Lord being described in this passage? Well, I suggest to you the context does not limit it, limit it to mean only one thing. And in my studies and looking at, you know, after you do my own study, looking at commentaries, there's a lot of commentaries which will try to say it just means this and only this. And I think that's a wrong way to think. Again, for the Christian, because look at the context in verse 10. It's describing punishment and reward. There's an encouragement and a warning. And then we come to verse 11, knowing therefore, you know, based on what I said, knowing that because of God's terror or fear, we persuade men. Paul's not talking about just one thing in verse 10. So again, I suggest to you for, for the Christian, for the believer, the fear of the Lord would indicate that reverence or that respect that we considered just a moment ago. You know, since we have this fear, since we have this respect for, for God, His will, we are going to desire to persuade people to, to, to trust in Jesus. However, for the unbeliever, the fear of the Lord indicates the terror of being forever lost. And so if we stand in awe of God's power and we love our fellow man, then we will try to persuade those who are lost. We should persuade them to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. So again, thinking about the word fear in the Bible, again, it has a flexibility to it. It doesn't just mean to be afraid. And I think that can trip us up as we read the Bible and we think about it because often when we hear the word fear, I mean, that's like the only definition we might think about. Right? We might not think about it means uh, respect uh, or reverence or, again, specifically um, fear of future punishment or something like that. Um, again, the word is somewhat flexible in how it's used in Scripture. So fearing God means different things depending on the context. It means we stand in awe of Him, that we have respect for Him, reverence Him, and we trust He will punish those He declares guilty. Now before I finish this morning, I want to say one last thing about the fear of punishment, and the lesson will be yours this morning. And I'd like us to read and consider this last passage in 1 John 4, verses 18 and 19, because he touches upon this idea of this, this fear of punishment, right? And, and this again would be reference to God and the judgment. And he says this, again, this is 1 John 4, verses 18 and 19. He says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. Again, I think some other versions say punishment, or is concerned with punishment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. So again, it's important to think about the definition of the word and how it's being used here. We ought to always fear God in the sense that we reverence him, we respect him, we stand in awe of him. That's a, that's a universal principle, right? All believers should fear God in that sense. 
But that's not the kind of fear John is describing. Right? The fear he's talking about, again, has to do with torment. Right? This fear of, of future punishment. And he's basically saying, if I could put it in my own words, we as Christians, we shouldn't be constantly living in fear, thinking God's going to send us to hell. Right? If our love for God is, is perfect or it's mature, and we know we're following His will, we should have confidence in our salvation. And uh, I hope each of us has that confidence this morning, that we become perfect in our love for God. And uh, we can love Him because He first loved us, as, as John uh, mentions here. So, in the Scriptures, we do have, again, a warning and an encouragement. And if you are here this morning and you're not yet a child of God, then you should be afraid of God. Because one day we're all going to pass away from this, this earth. And the Bible promises we're going to stand in judgment. And for those who are still guilty of their sins, they're going to be separated from God for all eternity. And so let's think about that warning soberly, uh, seriously. And uh, we encourage you. And again, my job is, is one of my jobs is I want to persuade you to believe and trust in, in Christ and trust in what the, the Bible teaches. And uh, I'm always willing to have a Bible study with anyone. If, any, if anyone's interested in that, ask, uh, answer Bible questions. Um, that's, that's what I love to do. And so um, if I could ever help you, just let me know. Um, but at this time, the invitation is extended. And we, uh, again, want to trust in what the Bible teaches. And again, the, the Bible teaches God can and will forgive you of your sins. And you don't need to live in fear of punishment. And so we encourage you this morning, if you haven't done so, repent from dead works. Um, confess your faith in Jesus Christ. Obey His command to be baptized. And uh, once you're uh, immersed in that watery grave, you're added to His body, uh, you're added to His people, and your sins are washed away uh, by His sacrifice. So if you'd like to do that this morning, or if we can offer prayers or encouragement for you, then please let us know by coming forward as we stand and as we sing.